Hello everybody and welcome to the special editorial version of me sitting in front of a camera and talking about books. These editorials I'm going to do my best to call Pop the Culture, where essentially I'm going to take something of popular culture and reflect it to something which is probably not so popular culture. So recently for a local publication I did a review of sorts on The Fault in Our Stars by John Green, which I really, do I need to say anything about that? Everyone's pretty much read it by this point. Or if you haven't, you know what it's about, so I don't need to tell you. Whatever the case, I made a point to look at the epigraph from which The Fault in Our Stars gets its name and which is quoted by one of the characters later on in the book. And it is from Julius Caesar. It is Cassius to Brutus where he says, The fault, my dear Brutus, is not in our stars, but in ourselves, for we are underlings. So what I'm going to be doing this episode is taking the time to talk about The Fault in Our Stars and Julius Caesar. Well, remember that time your English teacher said, hey, these skills you learn in English are going to be important later? The importance of those skills you learned in English class are not just so you can say you've read classic literature. It's so you can take something like a YA contemporary novel and say, hey, by the way, this is totally like Julius Caesar, you know, without the togas and the stabbing in the ancient Rome. And yeah, it's March. Roll with me on this, people. Roll with me. So again, that epigraph. Essentially what Cassius is saying in this point is that I don't believe Julius Caesar's rise to power is because of some divine providence. It's not fate. It's us, because we are cowards and we have failed to act. We have failed to stop this. So the fate of Rome right now is on us. It's a very, very interesting point. And while Julius Caesar, arguably one of the most boring at times of Shakespeare's tragedies, it's really all about old guys and togas standing around talking politics and power. That's a really, really interesting quote that highlights one of the biggest themes of Julius Caesar, which is I obviously fate versus free will. I do believe there's an element of that in The Fault in Our Stars. Now it's much more, I guess you could say, obvious what's going on when it comes to Julius Caesar and Shakespeare. Shakespeare is writing about politics. He's talking about the rise of Caesar, his eventual demise, and then the rise of Octavian, also known as Augustus Caesar. Does anybody else think it's totally not a coincidence that Augustus Waters is named Augustus when you have Augustus? Yeah, I'm, I'm totally just going forward right here. Yeah, that's probably a total coincidence. As much as I say that epigraph is about fate, it's also about the way one lives one's life. When Cassie says, I don't believe in fate, he is putting himself firmly in the camp of free will. He's saying, look, we make our decisions and those decisions we make are going to impact everything that happens. Therefore, anything that happens is on us. Cassius is a man of action. He's all about saying, okay, we have a problem, Julius Caesar. We need to deal with this problem. Let's kill him. Maybe not one of the best of ideas, but actually in retrospect, it kind of was too. I really don't know how to feel about being a proponent of murder in this case. With The Fault in Our Stars, we're not dealing with the fate of Rome, we're dealing with cancer. In this respect, cancer can stand in for the role of fate. Cancer is a force we can't control. You don't choose to have cancer just as much as you can't really choose to not have it once you do have been diagnosed with it. It's a force. It's uncompromising, unemotional, that you can't bargain with it. That's it. It is essentially like a death sentence in the same way that fate can seem that way to other people. Because let's be honest, when we read about fate a lot of the time, fate is not exactly a happy one. I'm just saying. Although John Green does have a character inside the novel who pretty much just says that line is complete bullshit, there is an element of the idea of, well, yeah, you know, fate doesn't rule us. Or in this case, cancer doesn't rule you. In fact, the male lead, Augustus Waters, has a point where he asks the protagonist, Hazel, what her story is. She begins by saying, I have thyroid cancer, it's spread to my lungs, and he cuts her off. He says, no, I don't want to hear your cancer story. He goes, your cancer is not you. He tells her, don't be one of those people who's defined by their illness. He says, I want to know your interests, your likes, your dislikes, your weird fetishes. Fun fact, he does actually use the phrase weird fetishes, and it's awesome. But he wants to know her as a person. As he's basically saying, the illness does not define you. You are not defined by this fate. You are still a person. It's what you do with what you've been given that makes you a person. And that controls everything else that happens in your life. Yes, cancer is obviously something that is going to control you more so than like, you know, some dude you don't like sitting in as dictator for life. Because as was shown, you can just kill Caesar. You can't really kill cancer. It's... It just doesn't work. Which can make The Fault in Our Stars seem all the more tragic because it's cancer. 
But what also makes The Fault in Our Stars so notably tragic is the fact that these are kids. This brings me into the element of family dynamics. Outside of the relationships between Hazel and Augustus and their friends and just between the teenagers, the biggest relationship is children and parents. Now, if you're familiar with Julius Caesar, which hopefully you might have paid attention your sophomore year of high school and when you read it, and so you do kind of remember it, you're gonna sit there and go, but there are no parent-child relationships in Julius Caesar. It's all old dudes and togas wandering around spouting stuff about letting slip dogs of war or being like, uh, I can't make a decision. Seriously, if you thought Hamlet couldn't make a decision, Brutus makes him look like a rank amateur. But... There is kind of a parent-child dynamic, sort of. Let me give you a brief little bit of history. So for those of you who actually were sitting there going, no, really, I like don't know anything about the play Julius Caesar, you probably at least know this one phrase. Et tu, Brute, the ultimate phrase of betrayal, which was said by Caesar to Brutus when Brutus had finally made that decision, said, yep, gonna kill Caesar, and delivers what in the play is the dramatic killing blow. Fun fact! Well, Shakespeare didn't necessarily invent that line. If you go back to the time of ancient Rome, what Caesar reportedly said, according to the ancient Roman historian Plutarch, was actually, of all things, a phrase in Greek. And that phrase was kaisu technon, which effectually means even you, my son. Now, you could be sitting there going, well, my son could just be a term of endearment, because Brutus was significantly younger than Caesar. He was closer to the age of Octavian, also known as Augustus Caesar, who would take over after Caesar died. After a brief period of basically kind of bloody civil war between a lot of the older dudes in Rome, well, yeah, there's kind of a bit more to that story. It was one of the biggest rumors at the time, which could have effectually had a lot of weight to it, that Brutus was actually <laughs> Caesar's illegitimate son. Yeah, in case you didn't know, Caesar was a bit of a player. So that actually enhances the tragedy, I think, of having Brutus deliver the killing blow to Caesar. And we therefore see how that inner turmoil of Brutus throughout basically the entirety of the play has even more weight to it. He would have obviously been very aware of this rumor that's going on, and if he believed it, which let's be honest, he probably did, he would have been basically going, I'm being told to go and kill my father. And we therefore also have this idea of a child causing a parent significant pain. Now you're saying, how does that relate to the fault in our stars? Because we obviously don't have kids killing parents. Well, one of the best quotes that comes from Hazel within the fault in our stars is where she compares herself to a grenade. She's essentially a ticking time bomb. Now she's obviously referring to her cancer and how it has spread to her lungs and how eventually something will happen and she will die and it's gonna wreck her parents. She's going to destroy them and she knows it. So that's why she closes herself off so much to the world. And if you look at that and compare to Brutus, who's obviously spending so long deliberating over the fact he has to actually physically destroy his parent. See the connection? Now, am I kind of pulling at straws a little? Yeah, I'll admit I am, but these are some things that struck me when I read The Fault in Our Stars and probably would also made me like it a whole lot more. But anyway, this is just a companion to my brief little review I did of the Fall in Our Stars for a local publication known as the Robius Quarter magazine, and it's going to be published on their site and currently on my own blog to go with this. But that's all for me today, you guys. So until next time, cheers.